Sorry to disappoint you, not a NASA astronaut, but do have some fun things to say about math today. Life is uncertain and unpredictable. Think about your own lives. How many of you have immigrated, changed careers, changed jobs? We don't know what our children will become, whether engineers and scientists or artists and musicians. We don't know what kind of a world they'll face. What we know for certain is that they'll face questions no one has asked in situations that are new and foreign to them. And our question becomes, how can we empower our children to navigate through the inevitable uncertainty of their lives? For my family, and for those who were raised in the tradition of Soviet education, the answer has always been math. From the 1950s through the 1980s, my parents were growing up in the Soviet Union, where the government was trying to answer this question on a societal level. In the midst of the space age, they needed to grow a generation of minds who could out-innovate and out-create the United States. There was a long-standing tradition in Russia at the time of academics being involved in education. And being a totalitarian regime, they could force those who weren't already into the process. So acclaimed mathematicians and psychologists and scientists began to look at this question and to build a system of education that would develop minds who could thrive in the world of the unknown. A core belief in Soviet culture is that a child's potential is not preset at birth. The mind could be developed. And what these academics uncovered is that math is the best tool to serve that development. This is something our modern society has begun to accept. A recent study showed that math skills in kindergarten and the first grade are actually a better predictor of later reading achievement than early literacy skills are. The next question was how. How could you teach math in such a way that it would empower children to look at never-before-seen challenges with an intuitive sense of how to approach them. There are four key elements to the Soviet approach. Early development of abstract thinking, building mental flexibility, challenge, and environment. The first, early development of abstract thinking was vital. Now, when I say this, and I see by the looks here, people immediately assume that I'm talking about algebra and recoil. But Abstract thinking is simply the ability to look at data points, determine the rule that governs them, and then apply that rule to something new. And children are particularly adept at this manner of thinking. My daughter, for example, is almost two, and we recently started working on colors. We would do this at bath time, where she would get into the bath, and I'd ask her to pass me the red fish. It took about two months for her to do this consistently, and by the end, it just became routine. She'd get into the bath, pass me the red fish, and carry on what she was doing. And it became clear that she didn't know what red was. She just knew that mom was really obsessed with that one fish. <laughs> and so then I moved on and asked her to pass me the red ball. This went a little bit faster. In about two weeks, she was passing me the red ball. And then finally, just a week ago, I asked her to pass me the red boat. She paused, scanned all the toys in the bathtub, and passed me the red boat. I no longer have to point to different objects and say, this is red. She has understood and abstracted the concept and understands that red is a color. And I think if you observe the children around you, you'll see that they live in this world of abstract thinking. It's how they make sense of the vast amount of information just hurtling towards them. Second, Soviets placed a fierce focus on building mental flexibility. People often mistake quantity of knowledge with the ability to apply it, particularly when it comes to math. But to the Soviets, the goal was to build knowledge in such a way that a child could look at a problem in which the concepts, skills, and techniques involved were unclear and approach it like a puzzle. They would pull from different areas of their knowledge, piecing together concepts and crafting a strategy to reach a solution, and start from square one if that proved to be a dead end. The third is challenge. We don't grow when we're in our comfort zone and living in an environment of consistent but not overwhelming challenge helps us to shed that nagging fear of failure so many of us have, or the idea that things should come easily. Now, these three things couldn't exist in a vacuum. Environment was key. To the Soviets, math was a social subject, and I mean that in every sense of the word. The culture was alive with this idea. 
teachers in love with mathematics would share that love with their students by asking just the right questions and providing just the right hints to provoke lively conversation. Classrooms were places where children would exchange and debate their ideas, kind of what you might see in an American English class. So why do I bring up this history of the Soviets? The Iron Curtain fell, the Cold War ended, I don't live in Minsk anymore, yay. <laughs> because if you look at the way we talk about math education today, it usually falls into one of two categories. Either it's utilitarian, there are many STEM careers and kids need to be prepared to grab them. Or it's aesthetic, math is beautiful and all around us and kids should be exposed to that beauty. Both of these things are true, but I think they miss the point. Yes, math can be both utilitarian and beautiful, but more importantly, and more profoundly, the study of math can be the vehicle that delivers kids to their fullest potential. Many people point to the various Soviet firsts, first satellite, first dog in space, first man in space, as a testament to the success of this system of math education. But I don't really think that's fair. These were the achievements of a small collection of great minds. A better proof of concept, if you will, was the experience of Soviet immigration. Hundreds of thousands of people fled the Soviet Union before its collapse. My parents, among them, frequently like to remind me that they arrived to the United States with two children, eight suitcases, and $360 when they were 30. They mentioned that last point a lot. They describe the experience of arriving to the United States as being akin to landing on the moon. Everything was different, not just the language, but the economy and the system as a whole. There were no mortgages in the Soviet Union. You were assigned a job. I'm sorry, you were assigned an apartment. No resumes, you were assigned a job. Suddenly, they were forced to navigate an entirely new world, entirely alone. For these immigrants, Math wasn't a base of knowledge upon which they found employment. It was a lifeline that enabled them to understand this completely foreign world. A few years after emigrating from Belarus to Boston, my mother came home from work and saw my brother working on his math homework and saw that he couldn't add two fractions with two different denominators. I call this her come to Jesus moment. She saw that uh, not only could he not do this, but he also emphatically insisted it was impossible and refused to continue the question further. Now, at this point, I'm pretty sure her head exploded. <laughs> and uh, most people attribute that reaction to that typical immigrant trope of, child doesn't know math, this child won't get good job, this child won't get married, there's no grandchildren. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that was true, knowing her and most immigrant mothers. Uh, but really what she was experiencing was real, crippling fear. My brother's inability to see beyond the specific fraction in front of him and consider what fractions actually are, or to pull from different areas of his knowledge and try to figure it out. And most importantly, that this inability caused him to just completely shut down all of this reflected that my brother lacked the same training that had gotten my mother through some of the most uncertain times of her life. This was a turning point for her, and she decided to leave her job to tutor him in math. And soon after, she and a fellow teacher partnered to open the Russian School of Math, an after-school math enrichment program. The school opened when I was in the sixth grade, and in its first year, classes were held at our kitchen table, which proved to be a particular challenge for my preteen self, as suddenly every trip to the refrigerator required an outfit change. <laughs> Luckily, that didn't affect anything. And today, the school serves 25,000 students in pre-K through 12 across the country. What this is, is a movement. A movement of people who feel that math should be more. Now, so far I've spoken in the theoretical, but I'd like to give you a sense of what this type of math instruction actually sounds like. So I've prepared an audio clip, and in this clip is a third grade class that has just been asked by their teacher, what is bigger, eight times x or six times x? 
8 times x or 6 times x? What is bigger? Uh, 8 times 8, eight, eight times, times x. x. 8 times x. 8 times x. 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 Zero, zero is explained. Okay. X is equal to x and 8 is bigger than 6. So? So that means that like it's like 8 is 2 more than 6. So it will multiply more times. Children, living in the world of the abstract, be encouraged to share their reasoning. Did you hear when the teacher said so, in a heavily accented Russian accent? Uh, it wasn't enough to say that eight is bigger than six. He had to explain why that mattered. And when the little eight-year-old boy says, I have a counter, in this case, I have a counter opinion, and they all jump in and say, yes, they could be equal if x is equal to zero, because eight times x and six times x. Just making sure you're all with me. <laughs> Imagine what happens to a child's mental development when they're steeped in this type of intellectual broth for years. To be completely honest with you, I didn't understand or appreciate the significance of this, even though I was raised in this mathematical culture, until just a couple of years ago. When my daughter was born, my husband and I sat in our hospital room, making a list of all the things we wanted her to be able to do in order to be prepared for whatever future was to come. Two hours later, and we still weren't done. She had to speak Mandarin, because China will take over the global economy. No engineering, because those skills can be taken anywhere. And let's not forget hard skills, like building a fire and sewing, in case The Walking Dead actually happens. Because <laughs> it, it's gonna. Um, it hit me suddenly that we were crafting a future for her in which every minute of every single day would be packed with some activity aimed to prepare her for any possible future. And in a moment of exasperation, I thought, I wish we could just teach her to think, to think powerfully, so that whatever happens, she can figure it out. Whatever world she encounters, she can navigate it. Our teachers have this mantra that the biggest tell between a student who's new and one who's been with us for years is how they react when given a problem they've never seen before. The new student will take a one second look, push the problem away and say, I don't get it. A student who's been raised in this environment of Russian math, as it's come to be called, will take a look at the problem, pause, raise their finger and say, let me think. I think if we change the way we view the point of math and see it as a tool for mental empowerment, we'll have a lot more kids approaching the challenges of their lives with a calm. Let me think. Thank you.